Father, we thank you for your word. As we approach it, we come with reverence, recognizing you are the one who has inspired it, and you're the one who opens its truth to us. And Lord, we ask for that, that you be glorified, be glorified in this place and in our lives. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. The Apostles' Creed was not written by the Apostles, although legend had it in the early centuries that 12 Apostles each wrote a line of the Apostles' Creed, but that's not why the church at large embraces it. We embrace it because it conforms to apostolic doctrine, what we find in the Scriptures. A lot of people have an aversion to creeds because they say, look, only the Bible is the Word of God. And I would say, absolutely. And it's our creeds that tell us that. And it's our confessions that tell us the Bible alone is the Word of God. But in talking to people, when you are in conversation and people ask, what is it you believe? You don't just say, well, have you got 70 hours? Because I will now read the Bible to you. And we'll start at Genesis 1.1 and we'll go all the way to Revelation 22. That's what I believe. And the person who's in the cult of, say, the Jehovah's Witnesses or the LDS, the Mormon Church, or whatever uh, strange belief someone has, they can read the Bible and not see what you see in the Bible because they have their pre-programmed ideas about what the Bible says. So over the centuries, the church at large has come up with creeds and confessions that summarize the teaching of the Bible. No one wants to believe something other than the Bible, but when we ask the question, what is it that the Bible teaches, and words come out of your mouth or my mouth, that is a creed of sort. People say, I just believe in Jesus. Great, there are many Jesuses out there. You can go to Mexico and find a lot of people with that name. And we need to know which one are we talking about. The biblical one or someone that is not quite on the same level. And there are many Jesuses, in fact, the Scriptures tells us that uh, there will be false Christs in the last days. So, when we ask the question, who is Jesus, and someone starts answering that question, they are coming up with a creed of sort. Last time we looked at some of the biblical creeds found in the Scripture. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 is the famous one of the Jews, which is called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, Teaching monotheism, there is only one God. And Jesus quotes that Shema in Mark chapter 12, verse 29. He understood the creed and he recited it. So we have not only Paul or Peter, but Jesus speaking of the creed. And so through the New Testament, we have the earliest creed of the church, found in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. That is, Jesus is Lord. Just three words in English, but representing so much more than what we can fathom. Because to say that meant oftentimes death for the Christian. The call of the empire was to say, Kaiser Curios or Caesar is Lord. And the Christians refused to do that, but instead said Jesus is Lord. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 12, it says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Understanding the background, you now know why. You're not going to say that unless the Holy Spirit's involved in your life because staying true to Jesus was more important to you than staying alive. This Apostles' Creed is an uninspired document and it was used as a teaching vehicle for baptism. It was produced around the year 190 AD at the end of the second century. And uh, as you look at the creed, you'll see very clearly there are three sections. One concerns God the Father, the second, Jesus the Son, and the third, the Holy Spirit. And right at the center of the creed was the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And so candidates for baptism were taught the creed, oftentimes in a catechesis. They were taught with question and answer in that kind of a format. And as they went into the water, either they themselves would recite the creed or the creed would be recited, this Apostles' Creed. And as it's read, they would be asked to affirm, do you believe this? And they would say, 
Credo, which is the word for I believe, or else they would say whatever word uh, in their language that would affirm the fact they believe this. Yes, I believe that about God the Father. Yes, I believe that about Jesus the Son. Yes, I believe that about the Holy Spirit. And on that basis, they were then baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now it makes sense. Now this thing comes alive to us and we realize that's how this creed was to operate. It was a vehicle to teach people the central truths of the Bible. It didn't become a creed until about 700 AD. It was used in that manner for baptism through the centuries. But about 700 years, uh, 700 years after the birth of Christ, it became a creed. Uh, recognized by the Roman Catholic Church, but all uh, true Orthodox Christians would affirm it, but it had been used in that baptism formula many years previously. That's important to know, and uh, the Nicene Creed was the earliest major creed of the Church, and we'll have more to say about that at a later time. But this Apostles' Creed is amazing as an uninspired document. Only scripture rises to the level to bind the conscience. But when we sum up what scripture teaches, we could do far uh, worse than understanding the Apostles' Creed. I wish more was added. I wish there was a line that affirmed sola fide or faith alone, justification by faith alone. That's not in there. But I weep in vain. I can't change history. But we've looked at this creed and we've looked at certain aspects. And last time we came to the point of the death of Christ. He died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. We recognize the death of Christ as the suffering of Christ on the cross and the message of substitution. That's all involved in understanding what this creed meant and means. Then it says he was buried and we affirm the fact that you only bury dead people. There was a real death and unless there was a real death there couldn't be a real resurrection. This was not a swoon, this was not someone who's just feeling bad and groggy but managed to revive in the tomb. He was D-E-A-D, dead, and he was raised. And for the Christian, death is not the end, and we'll have more to say about that in time to come. And he was raised, praise the Lord for that, raised from the dead. If we look at that creed, we understand that death is not the end, either for Jesus or for us. John Preston, who was a Puritan, uh, had something to uh, say about this. I have a quote I want to read about uh, death itself. I'm told that in America a poll was taken some years ago and uh, people were asked their number one fear. Number one was speaking in public. Number two was death. And I kind of laughed at that because people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. That's what it really means. Death is an enemy and death is conquered by the Lord Jesus. John Preston, the Puritan, knew this. I'm quoting J.I. Packer. When he lay dying, they asked him if he feared death now that it was so close. No, whispered Preston, I shall change my place, but I shall not change my company. As if to say, I shall leave my friends, but not my friend, for he will never leave me. Isn't that the message of Psalm 23? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. You're with me. He's alive, ladies and gentlemen. As we look at the creed, uh, it says certain words, and these words are each important. And it says that he descended into hell. There's usually a note that you see because it wasn't part of the original uh, creed. It was not uh, added until centuries later. And the word hell has changed in its meaning, at least in English. 
In the original language it was always uh, able to be understood, but it means not a place of torment, but the realm of the dead. And that's what we believe as Christians, that Jesus, after the cross, suffered no more torment. You ever heard sermons on the devil rejoicing for three days uh, over the death of Christ, rubbing his hands in glee because he'd conquered Christ? All of that is not found in the Bible. It's made up. Jesus said to a man next to him dying, Today you will be with me in torment. Uh, No, he didn't. In paradise, the realm of the dead. We could call it Abraham's bosom according to Old Testament terminology. The place of paradise was not quite heaven, but it was a place where the redeemed knew they were redeemed and were in peace rather than torment. Jesus, the Bible said in Colossians 2, overcame the devil at the cross, made a public spectacle of the devil, triumphing over them in it through the cross. In human terms, it looked like Jesus was failing as a prophet, failing as a teacher. There he was, dying as a criminal. But if we could see With more than earthly eyes, Jesus was winning, winning, winning. It was as if God, having a sense of humor, overcame a dragon by means of a lamb. You know, if you're going to overcome a dragon and defeat a dragon, you'd think you'd have to have a bigger dragon. But Jesus shows up as the lamb. And as this lamb absorbs the wrath of God due to sinners. He triumphed over he triumphed over every devilish scheme to keep man in his guilt. Praise the Lord for it. It's as if on the cross he said, "Take that devil. Take that." As stripes were laid upon his back. It looked like he was receiving the wrath of God and he was, but for us He bore our infirmities. He carried our diseases. He carried our sins in His body on the tree. And He bore the suffering due to us. No one had factored in the love of God that this holy God would send His Son to save humanity, all those who would trust in Him. That's what He did. It's kind of God's sense of humor. I know how I'll overcome the devil. With a roaring lion? Well, he is a lion. But on the cross, he was the passive lamb, just bleeding love words to his Father and glorifying him, absorbing the wrath as the Passover sacrifice for us. So many things from the Old Testament testifies of this Passover work of the Lord Jesus Christ that was to come. Now we look back and say, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. So he descended not into a place of torment, but into the realm of the dead. And as I say, it was not part of the original creed. Psalm 16 says that God will not allow the Holy One to suffer decay. And that's confirmed in Acts chapter 2, 27 through 31. You can read it in your own time. And it speaks there of that same quotation. Some have wrongly interpreted 1 Peter 3 that talks about Christ after His death preaching to the spirits in prison and see in those words that there is hope for people beyond the grave. They can hear the gospel again. That's not what was going on there. Christ was proclaiming His victory over all the power of the enemy and that's what was taking place. Not found in the text at all, that strange idea. Then it says he was raised the third day. Christianity is not about a dead Jesus. In any kind of other religion, that could have, they could have the religious leader die and stay dead and continue. Because the teaching of Islam is not based on the person of Muhammad. Muhammad never said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But Jesus said that. Islam is about the teachings of Muhammad, and after Muhammad is gone, 
the teachings can continue. Same with Confucius, same with Buddha, same with anyone you want to mention, but take away Christ from Christianity, there's nothing left because Christianity is Jesus Christ. He is the answer. He is what everything points to. He is everything for the Christian and the Christian message. There's no Christianity at all if there's a dead Jesus. I'm not interested, and you're not, I'm sure, either, in just a hero. We need a saviour. And that's what we have in Jesus Christ. Paul confirmed that and said if Jesus is still dead, if there is no resurrection, then your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15. There would be no hope for us. When we die, we would stay dead. There'd also be no fellowship right now with the risen Christ. If He's a dead Jesus, we can't have fellowship with someone who's dead. And there would certainly be no return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But all those things are affirmed by the resurrection. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 talks about Christ being declared to be the Son of God with power by means of the resurrection. It was God's approval of everything Jesus was and everything He said and everything He did. He says, this is how I show I am pleased with my Son. I raise Him from the dead. There's no one in the tomb, ladies and gentlemen. The body could not be produced. You know that the Romans wanted to do that. You know that the Pharisees wanted to do that. They could not. Thomas, after the resurrection, the one who doubted, who heard the testimony of others who'd seen the risen Christ but did not believe, said, unless I see, unless I feel, I will not believe. And Jesus appeared to all of them, including Thomas, and said, reach here your hand, touch me, see that I'm not simply a spirit, that I'm alive. He said, my Lord and my God. Jesus didn't say, oh, you're going a bit too far, I'm just a religious leader. No, he accepted that worship. Thomas went on to become a missionary to India. I've rehearsed this story, but I once preached in a church in India called Church of Matama, didn't mean too much to me until afterwards at the lunch table with the pastor of the church. He said, do you know our history? I said, I'm I'm sorry, I don't. He said, we go back to the first century. I thought, you go back to the first century? He says, yes, it was the Apostle Thomas who founded our churches. We're one of a group of churches and he died a martyr's death in India. We don't read that in our Bibles, but we read it in church history. We read the Bible and we think, come on, Tommy boy, pucker up, be a man, believe in Jesus. He was a man and he died for the resurrection that he questioned in the Gospels. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. He went on a missionary journey knowing it could cost him his life and he paid that price. And so church of Matama means... Church of Thomas. Praise the Lord. There's a real Jesus who's really alive. And Tommy Boy tells us that by his death even today. Praise the Lord. Declared the Son of God. Then the, uh, the creed says he ascended into heaven. Oftentimes we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ, Easter, the resurrection of Christ. And though it's on, on some people's religious radar... And on their calendar, we don't do too much with the ascension because we can't really put that in ways we understand because we didn't see him go up and we don't know what that looks like. But the ascension is crucial for the Christian because it says this, the Lord Jesus Christ is not only risen, but seated at the head of this universe. He's on the throne. There's a God-man on the throne. When He became a man, He became a man forever. And He's the one who's interceding for us. This is the place of supreme, the highest exaltation. Not merely a lofty location, but He's the supreme ruler of the universe. The king or queen of England may rule over England, but it's a borrowed crown. Jesus is the true King of England. The King of America is the Lord Jesus Christ. The King of China is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The whole world is in His hands. And He will come back as ruler of all things. And the message of the Christian is, Jesus the Savior reigns. It matters what you do with Jesus. It matters. And it's only a matter of time before all will see Him. We don't yet see Him with our earthly eyes. But He's the cosmic Lord of history. History is His story. Praise the Lord. He's ascended, ladies and gentlemen. He lives and He's on the throne. And Christians have been seated on that throne with Jesus. We have life with Him. We have communion with Him. We've already passed from death to life. Physically, we're in this world. Spiritually, we're with Jesus. We're in Him. We have every access to the Father because of Him. Just as God would never throw Jesus out of heaven, He cannot throw the true Christian out of heaven because they're in Christ. They're accepted in the Beloved. Ephesians chapter 1. I could get excited, but we're in church, so I'm going to calm down. (laughs) Then the creed says, He shall come. Do you see that? He shall come. I'm excited about the coming of Jesus. I first was converted under the sound of preaching about the second coming of Christ. I forgot all of the intricate details and probably that was a good thing. I'm not sure all that was taught that day, but I knew Jesus was coming and I wasn't right with Him and I needed to be. He's coming back. Jesus said, I will come again. Praise the Lord. He shall come. He shall come. Do you believe that? In a day of skepticism, when we look at our world and we think, oh, what will this man do or that man do who's got nuclear capabilities? And we read our Bibles and we don't read that someone in North Korea ends it all. But Jesus Christ comes back and does His thing and makes a new heaven and a new earth. God is not intimidated by the newspaper and by the internet and the latest news. He's on the throne and He's declared how these things will end. And so that's a reassuring thing for us as the people of God. I wonder if I could uh, find the Apostles' Creed in front of me. Here it is. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, the place of all authority. Didn't Jesus say, all authority is given to me both in heaven and on earth? And then he says, go. That's the Great Commission. On the basis of all authority, go. Not, I've got equal authority with the mayor, so go. (laughs) All authority in heaven and earth is given to me. You go in my name and preach that wonderful gospel. And then it says, from there, from where? From the place of all authority. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Old versions in English said the quick and the dead. It sounds like a Western, doesn't it? You're either quick or you're dead. (laughs) But the word quick there means alive. He's alive. And we are alive. And here it's speaking of those who are alive at His coming. He will judge those who are alive and those who are dead. That's what it's talking about. This is our biblical hope. I grew up in England where you hoped for good weather. And it was a distant hope. It was a longing hope. And you did not usually plan a wedding in February because your hope would be futile for good weather, uh, both with clouds and rain and storms and and nasty things. And even if you planned it for June or July or August, you still had to do a lot of hope. And you had to have a lot of hope in your heart because you had no idea, even at 9 in the morning, what the weather would be like at 11 in the morning. You don't have seasons, you have weather. Oftentimes, and uh, so you had a lot of hope, but we don't know in England whether that hope will be realized. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is it will happen. Whether or not you believe it, it will happen. Jesus is coming back. Whether or not you feel good about it, think it's true, He's coming back. He said so. 
The one who said, I will come the first time, has said, I will come the second time. He said, I will come through the prophets. And now through the apostles and prophets of the New Testament and through his own lips, he says, I will come again. He's coming back. That's biblical hope. We don't know the time. Don't set the day. Anyone who tells you they know, know this. They don't. <laughs> But for the individual believer at death and for all who are alive at His coming, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And God will send His Son the message, now's the time, and He will come. And both for Christians and for non-Christians, He'll be seen to be the ruler of this universe and every knee will bow. Not for salvation. It's as if they're made to acknowledge the supremacy of Christ. Hitler will acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ. Mussolini, Stalin, and you, and me. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And our prayer is, now we know Him. Oh, come Lord Jesus. Come, wrap this up. This land is a mess. This world is a mess. The sea is a mess. The mountains are a mess. Everything's a mess. Only you can sort this out. There have been many failed prophecies and that has led to uh, many people having a false hope and when it doesn't happen because they are told he's coming back on March the 21st and it doesn't happen, I just say, don't believe it. Just know he's coming back. He hasn't told us when. And when we go to be with him, it'll be all of us Christians. There won't be a first load and a second load. Like a load of laundry. Well, I hope I'm, I'm, hope I'm in the first load. Now he's coming back and all will see him and all that know him at that time will meet him in the air. That's our hope, ladies and gentlemen. Some people think it's an embarrassment because there have been failed prophecy. But it doesn't alter the fact. He's coming back. Our hope, our ultimate hope, is not in this world. This world is not our home. And in the meantime, let us not be worldly, but instead look for delayed gratification. In olden days, you had to actually have money before you bought something. And here with credit cards, we say, oh, what's $8,000 in de of debt? Well, it's $8,000 that tomorrow might be nine. And so it goes on. But for the Christian, we say, you know what? I could have the pleasures of sin now for a season, or I can have delayed gratification. When I see Him, all will be joyful. But the Bible says, be ready. Be ready. Be praying for revival. Be planning for world evangelism. J.I. Packer said this, budget and plan for an ordinary span of years, but in spirit, be packed up and ready to leave at any time. I like that. Make long-term plans and say, God, you can interrupt it at any time. I would like to do this before you come. You ever prayed that? I remember uh, some people in the youth group I was at praying for a spouse. Oh, Lord Jesus, don't come back till I get married. Eight weeks later, Lord, you can come back now. Lord, you can come back now. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> the creed goes on. The third section, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Uh, credo, I believe. Again, this had to be affirmed by those receiving uh, the baptism or being baptized. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Let me say this, the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not a liquid. He's a person. A divine person. We find Him on the second verse of our Bibles. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It was the Holy Spirit who enabled Mary to conceive in Matthew chapter 1. He spoke by the prophets. Scripture is breathed out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, we read. He has all the attributes of personhood. He is the one member of the Trinity that applies redemption to God's elect people. There's a unity of purpose in the Trinity. The Father elects, the Son dies, and the Holy Spirit 
applies that death and redemption to that same group. There's not one group here, another group there, another group there, and the, uh, the, the son saying to the father, well, you elected these, but I want to do more than that. I want to go for more than that. No, Jesus the son. The Bible says he will save God's people from their sins. He does it. He lays his life down for the sheep. He gave himself for the church. So it goes on. Scripture after scripture. This shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. The father elects this group. The son dies to them. And the Holy Spirit applies redemption to them. He works repentance in their hearts. He brings them faith as a gift. He's the one who, the Bible says, is the one who brings fruit to the Christian. The Bible speaks of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What is the fruit that shows the Holy Spirit is present in a person's life? It's love, joy, peace, the nine fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says about the Holy Spirit that He gives gifts to men. These are offices in the uh, book of Ephesians chapter 4, but also gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12. They're, they belong to Him. They're not uh, things that we have, they're found in Him. But all the attributes of personality, think of it, He has a mind. Romans 8 speaks of the mind of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 speaks of His will. He distributes the gifts, talking of the Holy Spirit, as He wills. He has emotions. The Holy Spirit has emotions. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. I've never had the force of electricity grieve over my abuse of it. Oh, you should not be using my electrical power to be watching that. I'm grieved. No. Electricity doesn't grieve, but the Holy Spirit can be grieved. He's a person. And the Holy Spirit speaks. Acts chapter 13. The Holy Spirit said, set aside for me Barnabas and Paul for the work to which I, that's the Holy Spirit, have called them. He's eternal, Hebrews 9.14. He's the helper, Jesus promised, John 14. And His work is to glorify the Lord Jesus, John 16.14. He leads God's people into all truth. He brings them the true gospel, tells them of the true God, enlightens their minds to see what they could not see before. He brings knowledge of the true God and of the true gospel. Next phrase... The Holy Catholic Church, with a small c, the word Catholic simply means universal. Do you realize in heaven there will not be a Baptist service, Presbyterian service, Methodist service, a black service, a white service, an Asian service? There will be one service. And by the way, it won't just be New Testament people, it will be Old Testament people too, because we all came in on the same basis. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Abraham will be able to sing the same song as you. I'm here because of the blood of the Lamb. How are you here? By the blood of the Lamb. But your Old Testament, yeah, we, we believed and God counted it to us as righteousness. Oh, where did God get that righteousness? From a tree? No, from the Lord Jesus Christ. They looked ahead to what Jesus did. We look back to what Jesus did. But we're all in heaven based on the same work of the sufficient, perfect Savior. That's why there'll be one service. We read the book of Revelation. It does not say, and the Methodist service from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., they said this. And then the Asians said this, because we came in a different way. And then the Jews said this. No, Jews and Gentiles... The wall of hostility has been broken down. We're all in because of Christ. Any Jew that's saved will not be in the kingdom because of their works, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in the Messiah alone. Amen. That's it. There's only one Jesus. There's only one Redeemer. And it's Him. Salvation is of the Jews. I'm going to be in heaven because of a Jew who fulfilled the law. And has given me righteousness, a righteousness that kept the law. It's perfect righteousness. I look in 
the, the book of my life and I think, oh, my sins. And God says, what are you talking about? I've wiped them clean away. You've got not only your sins forgiven, but positively the righteousness of one who fulfilled the law. The righteousness of Christ. The Holy Catholic Church. Do you know the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the creed before the church is and there's a reason why. Because it's the Holy Spirit and His power that brings forth the church. Just as God created the Word, excuse me, the world through the power of the Word, the Holy Spirit was hovering and then God said, let there be light and there was light. The power of the Holy Spirit went to move as the Word went forth. And that's how the world was created. That's how the church is created. When the Word goes forth, the Holy Spirit attends that Word and creates the church. Some people have the idea that it's the church that gives us the Bible. It's the Bible that gives us the church. It's the Word of God spoken that by the power of the Holy Spirit brings forth that which was dead into life and they're called out of darkness into His marvelous light. They are now the people of God because God speaks His Word. The Word of God creates the church. It's not the church that creates the Word. So we're not to sit over the Word. We're to sit and stand under it. The authority of the preacher is not, I say, whether he be a pope or a cardinal or a pastor or anything. His job is to tell the people what God says. He's under the Word of God. Rid that word Catholic of its Roman Catholic overtones, I beg you, because it's a beautiful word. I'm a Catholic. There. That's good for a YouTube thing, isn't it? Right there. I'm a Catholic. John's a Catholic. You're announcing the King's Church, you're a Catholic. Yes, I'm just not a Roman Catholic. I believe in the Catholic faith, the universal faith. And the Apostles' Creed says, this is what we believe. And it's not just something made up since 1960. But it's through the centuries. People have said, I believe, credo. I'll go to my death if I need to over these certain truths. Who Jesus is, what He's done in history. There's one worldwide fellowship. Think of it. You ever met a Christian from another part of the world and you realize we could support the same soccer team and we would not have in 30 years what we have in three seconds when I find out you're my brother, you're my sister. The fellowship we have. We can talk of Jesus and know we have life together. We have harmony together. There's one church and there'll be one church in heaven made of Jews and Gentiles. Praise the Lord. I'm looking forward to that. Except, when we gather as the people of God on the Lord's Day, do you know what? We're part of the church, universal, which is both a heavenly church and an earthly church. And according to Hebrews 12, right now we've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. And that's why I get nervous. I'm preaching in front of Ezekiel, for goodness sake. <laughs> Daniel, Samson, Moses, Old Testament saints, Peter, Paul. Why? We're all with one voice around the throne. We can't see it with earthly eyes. But one day, our bodies will catch up with what is real. We're already seated with Christ in heavenly places. And as we gather as the Lord's people. That's what's going on every Sunday morning. We're gathering with the people of God. You say, I want to get close to my mom. Well, if she's a Christian, join with her. Singing of the Lamb. One day you'll see her with your eyes. Praise the Lord. All of us under the headship of Christ. All Christians everywhere. You know, we're going to lose our denominational tags and labels when we get to heaven. There won't be a section that says Methodist only. There's a story of a man who was getting a tour of heaven. And he went through this very, very large room and he said to the angel, well, who's that in there? And he says, that's all the Baptists. Wow, that's a lot. Went past another room and, uh, no, who, who's all them then? These are the Methodists. Whoa, I had no idea that 
Methodists are in heaven. Wow. <laughs> Loads of them. Wow. Uh, but you need to be quiet when we go past this third room. Oh, oh why is that? Oh, well, the angel said, that those are the Presbyterians. Well, why do I have to be quiet? Well, they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Just Christians in heaven. People that love Christ. From every tongue, every language. People that can't say the word Presbyterian. They're still going to be there. Praise the Lord. There's going to be John the Presbyterian. I mean, John the Baptist. He's going to be there. Praise the Lord. There's what we call the invisible church. I used to think those are the people that don't show up on a Sunday. That's not what it means. Invisible church. That means the church that is invisible to us. Do you realize this? God knows who His people are. We often don't. You ever been fooled? Someone who said, I'm a Christian and then... Sometime down the line it becomes obvious they're not really a Christian. God's never been fooled. The Bible says the Lord knows those who are His. And that's what we call the invisible church. Not invisible to God, but invisible to us. It'd be great in counseling if someone who's the true elect of God, God would give the counselor a sign. You'll know that this is a true child of mine because... The head revolves just for a few seconds and you'll know that's the sign that they're one of mine. Wouldn't that be great in counseling? It, sorry, I don't see your head revolving. None of this is going to do any good. You can go. <laughs> no, we don't know. But God knows. The Lord knows those who are His. And so we preach the gospel to everybody. We don't look for the letter E stamped on anybody's forehead, E for elect, we don't, we preach the gospel to everybody, but God knows those whom He has chosen and God will bring them to life. It makes, uh, they make a passing comment, Luke does in Acts 13, when the gospel is preached, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And then he just goes on to the next thing. That's startling. That's how the early church saw it. We go into all the world, we preach the gospel to every creature, but God knows ahead of time those who are His. His sheep will hear His voice. Praise the Lord. So the invisible church is invisible to us. And the visible church is the professing church. And how many know, not everyone who says, I'm a Christian is a Christian. Many will say to me, did I not do this in your name? Lord, 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 Lord. And He says, depart from me. What? I Never knew you. Not, I knew you for eight months, but then you blew it. No, there was never a redemptive relationship. God knows those who are His. There's the invisible church, and then there's the visible church. And amongst the visible church is the invisible church. Those that show up, God says, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's go high. 93% of the visible church is part of the invisible church. I hope it's not 8%. But we don't know the number, but God does. But the Bible says that a number that no man can count. A vast, vast number, which is the hope of evangelism, right? That's why the early missionaries, after the Reformation, went to the tribes, the lost tribes, with the gospel. Because the B-I-B-L-E says, Jesus redeems people from every tribe. There must be His elect here. That gives me confidence to go preach. People say, I don't believe we can go evangelizing if there's something called election. I'd say, I wouldn't evangelize if there wasn't. The only reason I can have hope is that God says, I have my elect here. Well, you mean amongst MS-13? Yep, I'm sure he has some. You mean amongst Australian people? Yep, yep, he, 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 I believe he has some. So it is. The Holy Catholic Church. There's one church! That's exciting. I want to be part of His church. Jesus never said He'd build mine. He said He'd build His. I'll build my church, He said. Next word. Well, it's not in our creed, but it's in uh, our Bibles. And that's uh, apostolic, under apo apostolic doctrine. Here we're talking of the church as God sees it under God's authority. 
And there's a unity in heaven and on earth between what is called the church militant, that's those on earth, and the church triumphant, those in heaven. Those in heaven have triumphed over all their enemies because of Christ. They've entered into rest. And in earth as it is in heaven, we're to be in one accord. Do you know the church, before we get off this, is a supernatural society. Totally supernatural. The next phrase, the communion of saints. We have a unity and a union with brothers and sisters in Christ. The church is the only organization that never loses a member at death. Think about that. And the local church is central in God's purposes. All those in the invisible church are called to be members of a visible local church for worship and for witness. <coughs> Let's move ahead for the sake of time. The next phrase, the forgiveness of sins. Sins. Even here, there's a recognition of man's issue, his sin. It's everyone's issue. He died for us, for our sins. He saved, as the hymn says, a wretch like me. Sin leaves us under God's wrath, which is the overflow of a good and holy God. He must dispense wrath for those who have violated His holiness. If you have a Bible, go to Psalm 130. Just want to look at one verse here. Though we've been quoting scriptures, we have not turned to too many here. So, Psalm 130, look at verse 4. But, well, let's go back a little bit to verse 2. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? It's a rhetorical question, but the answer is obvious. No one. No one could stand. If God simply counted up our sins and marked them, no one can stand in His presence. Verse 4, But, thank God for the but, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There's a pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. But without forgiveness, there is no peace. This forgiveness is at the cost of the death of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He, God, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. There's forgiveness, and more than that, righteousness. We call it justification. And it's by faith alone. It's theological shorthand for the work of Christ alone. How? By His life of fulfilling the law for us and His death in dying for our sins. Praise the Lord, there is forgiveness of sins. Next phrase. We believe in the resurrection of the body. Death is an enemy, not a friend. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. Romans 6.23 Hear this verse, 1 Corinthians 15.32 If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The Bible does not say, well, believe anyway, even if this thing isn't real. It's the best kind of life you can have. No. If death is the end, Christianity is futile. But death is conquered. And the Bible says that Christ will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. Philippians 3.21 The more I get old, the more I think that's a good thing. When we're young, we say, oh, that you know, might be a little bit of an improvement. But when we're old, we think, that'll be awesome. <laughs> will we know one another in heaven? Well, if you went to Dallas Airport, would you know someone in this room if you saw them there? Yeah, uh, Dallas is a place and heaven is a place and you and I will be given bodies, glorious improved bodies, but we'll have bodies nonetheless. And John 5, read in our hearing, speaks of the raising of the body and the restoration of all the person 
And that's what we have in the Christian life. Not just simply a resurrection of the soul, but all that we are. According to J.I. Packer, to active, creative, undying life for God and with God. That's what we'll have with a new body. It'll be a body linked with the old. You'll still be able to recognize one another, yet it'll be different, gloriously improved. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 44. Do you know in heaven there'll be no wheelchairs? There'll be no need for glasses. There'll be no seeing eye dogs. You won't be going up to Paul and saying, Love Galatians, and he says, What was that? <laughs> no, he'll hear you. <laughs> We wait for the resurrection of the body. We wait for the redemption of our body, Romans 8 says. We wait for this. You see, our body is our earth suit. For this environment on earth, you need a working earth suit. You go to space, you need a space suit. And God will give you a heaven suit when you need it. God has given us cosmic redemption. All the curse will be removed. And for those who have lived a life where their bodies have been something of a prison, they will be released there in heaven. What a joy. And God will make a new heavens and a new earth and give you a body specially made for it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> life everlasting, the last phrase. Do you know, heaven won't be boring. Oh, I'm not sure I want to go and sit on a cloud and play a harp. Well... <laughs> I'm not sure that's what you'll be doing, but it won't be boring. Do you know what the Bible says about being in God's presence? People say, I went to church and I was bored. Well, that's possible. But one thing that's not possible is to meet with God and be bored. There's no one in our Bible who says, I met God and I was bored. No, woe is me, I'm undone. They fell down on their faces. They shouted. There was some reaction when they met God. But one thing that was never a reaction was boredom. In His presence, there's fullness of joy. It's as if God's looked around the universe and weighed everything and thought of uh, Disneyland and Disney World and every adult thing that might be something like that and thinks, now what's the best thing in this universe? I know, it's me. I'll give them me for eternity. If God gave you anything less, He doesn't really love you. But because He loves you, He's going to give you access to Himself forever. Oh, praise the Lord. That's our blessed hope. This is not mere endless existence. Jesus prayed in John 17, My prayer is that they may be with me where I am, with you, Father, together. The hymn says, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining, shining as the sun, we have no less days to be bored than when we first began. Is that what the song says? No less days to sing His praise than when we first began. I quote uh, J.I. Packer quite often this morning. Let me do so one more time. He's nearing the end of his earthly life, his earthly pilgrimage. And he writes this. It's a bit of a lengthy quote, but we're coming to the end. Hold on, there is hope. <laughs> I've been writing with enthusiasm, talking about uh, certain things, but for this ever everlasting life is something to which I look forward. Why? Not because I'm out of love with life here. Just the reverse. That's people's reaction is... I'm enjoying life too much to think about heaven. You ha need to think more about heaven. Oh no, don't, remember, don't you remember the phrase, he's so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. I've met those kind of people, but if you read your Bible, the person who was most heavenly minded was the Lord Jesus Christ and he did the most earthly good. Why am I looking forward? Not because I'm out of love with life here, just the reverse. My life is full of joy from four sources. Knowing God and people and the good and pleasant things that God and men under God have created and doing things that are worthwhile for God or others or for myself as God's man. But my reach exceeds my grasp. Here's where it gets interesting. My reach exceeds my grasp. My relationships with God and others as never are never as rich and full as I want them to be. 
And I'm always finding more than I thought was there in great music, great verse, great books, great lives, and the great kaleidoscope of the natural order. As I get older, I find that I appreciate God and people and good and lovely and noble things more and more intensely. So it is pure delight to think that this enjoyment will continue and increase in some form. What form? God knows. And I'm content to wait and see, literally forever. Christians inherit, in fact, the destiny that fairy tales envisage in fancy. We, yes, you and I, the silly, saved sinners, live and live happily. And by God's endless mercy, we'll live happily ever after. We cannot visualize heaven's life, and the wise man will not try. Instead, he will dwell on the doctrine of heaven, which is that they will, there the redeemed find all their hearts desire joy with their Lord, joy with his people, joy in the ending of all frustration and distress and the supply of all wants. What was said to the child, you want sweets and hamsters in heaven, they'll be there, was not an evasion but a witness to the truth that in heaven no felt needs or longings go unsatisfied. What our wants will actually be, however, we hardly know, save that first and foremost we shall want to always be with the Lord. Often now we say in moments of great enjoyment, I don't want this ever to stop, but it does. Heaven, however, is different. May heaven's joys be yours and mine. As we end this, I have uh, something I want to put in your hands. And I've done a little bit of work with this. And uh, if I can have uh, maybe a couple of volunteers, there's uh, some handouts just over there. There's one for each adult amongst us uh, there on the table. And what it is, is a lot of questions and answers on the Apostles' Creed. And it's something of a catechism. It's from the Anglican Church, and I've taken out some of the things that relate only to Anglicans, and I've revised it a little bit. I've said where I got it. But I want you to take this home. I want this to be a blessing in your life. This is really valuable stuff that has been worked out over many years as the people have looked through the scriptures as they've seen the Apostles' Creed. And as you take this home, I just want to encourage you to read it, familiarize with it, yourself with it, and, for, and to look up all the scriptures that are related and referenced, and let it become part of you. And as we quote and recite this Apostles' Creed, let it become something more of than, than simply a historical interest. But let it be something that is true to your heart. I know in whom I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches this. This is our God, Father, Son, and Spirit. This is His Son, the Lord Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit, and this is what He's done in history. I commend you to that and receive it as a gift. I believe it will be precious to you over time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that is ours because of the Bible. And though the Apostles' Creed never rises to that level, it's a summary of what the Bible teaches and I believe a faithful summary. And Lord, may we be people that know our God and know His truth and live in the good of it that others might taste and see that the Lord is good because we have tasted and seen ourselves. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.